All right, folks, welcome back to Let's Play Starflight. I'm the Mysterious JG, and it's time for us to start doing some interstellar exploring. And not disembark. <laughs> but I need to get a drink of uh, soda here, so. Yep. I'm a real professional at this whole LPing business. I started recording and then immediately take a break for a drink instead of getting a drink and then starting to record. Anyways, um... Let us go to the navigator. Fleebix. Look at. Fleebix! You're turning blue. Okay. And let's get out of it. Now, this is more convenient than the last game because our system, our base, is the only thing in that system, so we don't have to try to remember where that is. Motion immediately detected because, as we were told, we actually start the game in somebody else's space. So there will be ships flying around around Starport. And by the end of the game, we'll be really sick of them because, um, you know, they're a fairly friendly group, but once we've heard everything useful they have to say, they're just going to keep showing up and I'm just going to avoid talking to them to save time. Um, the game map that I didn't bother to uh, make handy before we started recording actually marks which of these stars have intelligent species. I'm pretty sure this is one of them. I could be totally wrong. Our science officer, however, is trained up, so the smartest thing we could do, potentially, is just to search nearby planet, planetary mm -hmm. systems for habitable worlds. Now, it's amazing to me how, you know, I'm like, as a kid, I just wasn't able to figure this shit out, but it should be pretty easy to spot which ones can support life here. Uh, there's no water, there's no oxygen, this one's not going to be useful. And the game takes away a certain amount of the exploring aspect because, as they meant, they mentioned the Humna Humna. The Humna Humna have actually already charted all this space, and they're on, we're on fairly good terms with them. So that's why we start... There's a better explanation for why we start out with the star chart than there was in the last game, but there was no explanation. But the last game gave us a bunch of stars, but no information on what was there. This game just tells us which ones have species. But, um... the culture button now that Nobunaga can refer to. It's like, their culture is worthless. But, um, yeah, that basically means that if, um, if there is a plant, if there is a sentient, uh, life form on the surface, we can get information from them from a humna 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 database, um, because the humna humna have already actually gone to talk to all these people. So we're not the first explorers in this region, and we can take advantage of what's already been done. So I'm basically just going around looking for planets that we can colonize, because that's the fastest way to get money, especially at the beginning of the game. You need money to make money in this game, other than colonizing planets. Um, so if I was going around trying to make money through trade, right now I don't have enough capital to invest in anything that I could potentially take far away from where I bought it to sell for a good price. This planet I had some hopes for, because it looks on the picture there like an Earth-style planet, but there is no hydrosphere. And uh, it is obviously not habitable. M-class planets in this game, I believe, are light blue. So normally, M-shara class. This what this is obviously a gas giant. I don't even know why I'm scanning it. Fourteen times Earth's gravity. We're not going to be colonizing it. And I thought, huh, maybe this place had uh, an intelligent species. I was clearly wrong. Let's look at the old star map. There would appear to be ace. alien ships around. Quite a few of them. Alright, well, let's have our first uh, alien encounter. That happened a lot faster than it did in Starflight 1. This is exactly who I expected it to be, but, you know, you don't know who they are yet, so. It is a warship, but it's the same size as our ship with class 2 shields. And they are raised. Culture, no civilization detected because. Well. There's no humming humming a beacon on this thing telling us who they are. So let's be friendly. Greetings. We come in peace and wish to communicate. Please identify yourselves, says Duke Togo. Actually, Duke Togo just hits the communicate, the hail button, and then says... Ta -ta -ta -ta. Well, let's see if they're going to respond. I would imagine they're going to respond. 
Captain, we're being scanned. Yes, yes, of course we know why you have come here. As students of Thadak Prag ah, we are capable of seeing only the truth. You have come to praise us, but we do not seek your tribute. We seek only to share our wisdom. We are the Ashvara. Do you have any information you can share with us about yourselves? Yes, well, a most auspicious beginning to your initiation as a disciple. Yes. Now you begin to learn the way of the Ashvara, the way of truth, certainly, yes, the Thadak Prag. Ah. We would greatly appreciate some information. Is there anything you can tell us about yourselves? Heed well, young acolyte, yes. Beware the heinous lies, the malevolent Eshvi. They are insidious impostors who have corrupted the true faith, yes, and utilize ceremonies born of superstitious ignorance. The Eshvara system is located at 353069, while the Eshvi system is at 2974. Do not confuse the two. The Eshvi cannot be trusted. In this game, you actually... Oh, is it the fact that... Is it in fact the case that you have come here to learn of the Tharak Pryog? Ah, that's their religion. It's a good idea to say yes. Perhaps I shall now tell you of the Tharak Pryog. Ah. Let's ask them about themselves, learn what we can. The way of the universe is the way of the Tharak Pryog. Ah. The way of Tharak Pryog ah, is the way of ceremony, yes. All things we Ashvara do are Tharak Pryog. Ah. Every look, every movement, every word, just so, just so. Hmm. Every Ashvara must perform the Dakpryag ah, at all times in accordance with the 207 divine inspirations in order to ensure auspicious universal harmony, yes. One mistake would instantly bring upon us the great universal fiery cataclysm, cataclysmic apocalypse. Apocalypse now. In the grand cosmic scheme of things, I sense that we have talked just the correct amount of time. I must therefore terminate our discussion before we create a dangerous imbalance of cosmic forces. Communications have been terminated. Now the thing about the Tandalu Eshvi and the Eshvara, you know, they're religious guys, they are not murderous religious guys like the Gazatoid in the last game. This game still takes the mickey out of religion uh, in the form of the Tandalu, because as you can see, all they want to talk about is their religion, and it's pretty vague what it is, but it's very spiritual and auspicious and whatever. So they kind of make fun of religion. But um, the Tandalu are much... Well, they're just nicer than the Gazertoid who wanted to kill you for being an air breather. And we can get a lot of useful information out of them eventually. They gave me the coordinates for, a, uh, th for two systems, and you might have noticed that I didn't bother to write them down. We can actually, in this game, one of the improvements is you can go read through your old messages. So as you can see, I can go back through and find that information, which means it's less essential for me to take a lot of constant notes. As long as I remember who gave me the clues, we can find them. I believe this is actually 2974. Yeah, this is actually one of their home worlds. But I don't really feel like playing with them just yet, so I'm going to instead look around for planets that we could potentially colonize. because that'll be a good source of cash at the beginning of the game. So there is a class M planet. It would be pretty nice if this turns out we can colonize here. Damn. This is not going to be a habitable planet. Alright. Keep looking. This is a gas giant. I'm just scanning it for funsies. Scanners indicate unidentified object. Okay. Let's see what this is. Promethium radium silicon. 18 times the size of our ship. Class 5 shields, and it's not armed. No civilization detected. This is uh, Captain. S this is Captain Seymour Guado of the ISS Blue Dragon. Hold, I have a request. Gorzek system transmitting to approaching object containing carbon-based biological forms. Identification acknowledged. 
as representatives of the peoples of Arth, we extend our best wishes and hope to rape Yuna. Corsac system awaiting query. Corsac system awaiting query. Uh... We are interested in information concerning yourselves. Current access is restricted to general info. Recommend inquiries be directed to this topic. Do you have any information you can share with us? Current programming prohibits all non-essential communications. Class 1 directive, imperative, primary, alpha, alpha constrains all non-maintenance or defense functions to support of hostilities between Tandiluvian sects. Wait a minute. To support... I think it's supposed to say cessation of hostilities. If I recall from playing this game previously, this guy is trying to prevent the Tandaloo from killing each other. He's actually... He, he, Korzak's a nice guy, as we'll find out. Bringing about cessation of hostilities between Tandaloo would alleviate programming directive, override, and allow communications behavior... communicative behavior, highest probability of success, 0.811 to 0.893, derived from possible futures, 67.8, E34... E341 to 3. 39, blah, 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 not lots of numbers. Uh, basically, what he's telling us is he can't talk to us until we prevent the civil war. Fundamental pivotal constraint entails future of Tantalovian artifact designation most valuable thing. Basically, oh, Corsic system awaiting query. He, uh, we're being scanned, and he's still awaiting queries. Relevant data required for event, sequence, subset, blah, 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 to blah, 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 wherein the most valuable thing is returned by ISS Blue Dragon as follows. Artifact stolen by Spemin. Present location, Planet 2. System coordinates, 158, 183. Planetary designation, Bemf Blunk. Planetary coordinates, unknown. Highest probability of information source, Spemin. Second highest, Humna Humna. Do you have any information you can share with us? Current programming for seven. Okay, he's repeating himself. So, what was that about? Well, here's the deal with Gorzek. We don't know exactly what Gorzek is, but it's clearly some kind of AI. We don't know who built Gorzek or why, but it seems to be programmed to prevent the Tandalu from wiping each other out. It has told us that it can't communicate with us until we prevent the Tandaluvian civil war. So, we've met one of the Tandaluvian groups. Uh, I can't remember if it was the Eshvara or the Eshvi, but frankly, they're identical, because they're two groups. They're the same species. It's like aliens finding a war between the British and the French. They are, on the surface of things, the aliens are going to have a hard time telling the difference between the English and the French. They're all a bunch of bipeds. <laughs> you know. Um, so, it's going to look like you know, the same. And that's that's the deal with the Yeshvi and the Yeshvara to us. It's like, well, they're all these kind of big broccoli guys with lots of arms. Um, they're fighting each other. We can't really tell the difference. Um, so there's apparently an artifact called the Most Valuable Thing. It was stolen by the Spemen. Gorzak gives us the coordinates for the planet where it's being held, but he doesn't tell us who's whole, or exactly what the coordinates on the surface are. He gives us the coordinates for the planetary system, but not the location on the planet where we can actually find it. Uh, the Spemen in this game are hostile. Regardless of how you play Starflight 1, this game does not go back and check your Starflight data to see how you treated the Spemen, but the game is basically programmed for the assumption that if you won Starflight 1, you probably did what that game really encourages you to do, which is beat up the Spemen, use hostile communications with them in the future to get information out of them. And the Spemen, of course, truly have it coming. I mean, they go around threatening you, but they can't back it up. So when you, basically, they, they talk a bunch of crap, you give them a bloody nose, and then they kowtow in fear. The game wants you to treat them hostily, but it does make sense that when they get their hands on some power, they're going to, you know, want to use it to kick your butt. So in this game, they assume that you've got it coming. And the Spemen however, is still not very likable. So in this game, the Spemen have stolen the most valuable thing. We've got to find out how to get it back. Gorzak told us the planet, but he also told us that uh, our best source of information on where it actually is located on the planet is going to be the Spemen themselves. When I played this game years ago, I kind of assumed that that wouldn't work. It's like, no, the Spemen aren't going to tell you anything. The Spemen are bad guys. And while it makes sense that he would... He's thinking, who possibly knows where this thing is? The Spemen, obviously, because they have it. 
and the second would be the humna humna. So I've assumed you have to go to the humna humna and figure out uh, the information on this. Uh, but while playing around off camera, I found out that you can get the spam to tell you, and that's probably what we'll end up doing. It's kind of amusing. But anyway, 158.183. is where the most valuable thing is. That sounds far away. 158.183. This is a gas giant. So it's really not worth messing with. One fifty-eight, one eighty-three. Gorzak, I have a feeling. Considering that there's a puzzle you have to solve before you can talk to Gorzak, really, I have a feeling that he will give you pretty good information once you've you can talk to him. But one fifty-eight, one forty-three is. pretty far away and it's in the cloud nebula the game is called trade routes of the cloud nebula and there's a reason for that look at this freaking thing there's a single nebula in this game that is bigger than all nebulas in the previous game put together And it's not much of a spoiler because the species that you, you will find out fairly early before you ever go into this nebula from the species that you talk to. The cloud nebula is very, very dangerous. There is a hole in the middle of the cloud nebula, which, I mean, just looking at the game map, you can tell right from the beginning there must be something pretty important plot-related going on in there. There's got to be. It's kind of like that's where you'd expect to find a uh, laser eye death god from Star Trek V if he was in this game. Something important must be going on in the center of that big honking nebula, but it's a really dangerous place to go. There is no way it would be a good idea for us to go into the cloud nebula right now. But apparently we're going to have to penetrate the cloud nebula a little bit to get to the planet Bemphplunk, which is where the Spemen have stashed the most dangerous, or most dangerous, the most dangerous game. That's where they've stashed the most um, valuable thing. Hydrogen and water. No, oxygen. Close and yet so far. Now, obviously, the humans could set up a colony there. They just need artificial... They need, you know, respirators on all the time, but that's... No, we need to find a planet that has its own natural oxygen. This is not it. And I don't know how much flying around without finding a planet that we can call on, a recommend for colonization I'm going to do before I give up on doing that as a way of earning money. I'm pretty sure we already scanned this, but... Yeah, not even, not even close to being uh, colonizable. So, I got so much dust on my screen, and the sun is coming in in such a way that it's really, any little piece of dust on my screen is like really visible to me, so it's kind of hard for me to tell where planets are. 3887 is the next planet that's worth checking out, or the next system that we might be able to, ah, no, wrong. There we go. Uh, I have a feeling that this was not worth the trip. Now, if I wanted to cheat a bit, I could find maps. If I wanted to cheat a man. Now, if I wanted to cheat a bit, there are maps I can find on the interwebs that show you where all the colonizable planets are. But I'm trying to play this relatively fair. I already remember a lot about the game from previous playthroughs, so... But I'm sort of attempting to play through this as you would if you were picking it up for the first time. Not take advantage of any special knowledge I have. Although in order to make things go a little faster, I might eventually break down and start taking advantage of stuff that I really shouldn't know about yet. I happen to know where there are some humna humna we can visit, and trading with a humna humna can be extremely profitable. 
but I also remember from playing off screen that they never freaking show up when you want them to. At least in space. Encountering them in space, where if you get on their good side, you can eventually buy trade route maps from them, they never freaking show up! You end up running into other species instead. 3291. And this is really... You're in danger of just turning into a huge waste of fuel. And the fuel is not cheap in this game. It d I don't remember. It doesn't seem like it's as bad as getting Endurium was in the first game. But it's still a very big limiting factor. No oxygen. No water. No nothing. And uh, eventually there's you'll come across an artifact called a system scanner, which will make this go a lot faster. I believe it automatically scans the system and alerts you to any habitable planets. So you don't have to do around, go around scanning them individually. No oxygen. Nitrogen, oxygen, water. I oh, I came so close to skipping this one because of the color. Searing to Inferno. Oh, I'm gonna check. I mean, they could live indoors, but I'm pretty sure searing means you can't live there. I think there has to be lower. Um, yeah. Some portion must fall with an exemptor. Yeah, you have to have temperate or tropical somewhere. Now, it's weird. A planet that's entirely Arctic, you'd think you could recommend for colonization. It wouldn't be a very good place to live, but you could still live there. But no, it's some place has to be temperate or tropical. So searing to Inferno means the planet's too hot. Damn! It's got everything else. But no, we cannot actually... Well, I mean, we could recommend it, but we would lose money. We would get fined for recommending it. It would be a uh, be considered unlivable, and we'd be fined for wasting uh, Interstellar's time and money sending out a colony sh ship. Excuse me, fifteen ninety three at least. If there's nothing at this system, there's another system nearby. But it would appear that this whole thing was just a big waste of fuel. No oxygen. So, can't live there. There's not really that many uh, planets in the game that you can recommend for colonization. I mean, the vast majority of planets are obviously not going to be able to support life. This one, for example, cannot support life. Small planet, mostly brown. And it would appear that this whole trip was a waste. Because these are all going to be gas giants. Helium and hydrogen. Could be a lot of videos like this, folks. Just me looking for planets. I told you the trade is interesting, but I wanted to get some cash going from a successful... Um, colonization recommendation before we started uh, trading. But it looks like I'm just going to waste a bunch of fuel, and that's pretty much all it's going to be. There's Promethium, Copper, and Gold, all of which sounds like good sources of money, but in this game, you just can't rely on using minerals to get rich. So this planet, this is all the way off by itself over here. This, uh... Two seventy-six. Let's head down there. I probably should have just used local trading to uh, earn money until I got to the point where I had better engines, because I'm burning through fuel pretty quickly with all these wasted efforts. Now there's like three Class M's here. So... I'm hoping that I either find 
a uh, colonizable planet, or possibly an inhabited planet with a deflated economy. There are inflated, deflated, and standard economies in this game. You want to buy in the deflated economies and sell at the inflated economies. Now this planet looks promising. But it's not, because it doesn't have oxygen. Now with these blue planets, I'm expecting to either come across a uh, humna 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 uh, trade buoy, which will boy, which will tell us the humna humna trade buoys, which will tell us that the planet's inhabited, or finding out that when we scan it, it's got freaking oxygen. Damn it! No. Here are our last chances. Other one's a gas giant. Oxygen! Water! Tropical to inferno! 0.13 gravity? Is that too low? The gravity of a planet must not be crushing, and it's preferable if it's lighter than very heavy. Gravity must be below 2 Gs for a planet to be suitable for colonization. 0.7 to 1.3 is optimal. Okay, so this planet will not have optim this will not be an optimal planet. But with oxygen and water, a thin atmosphere, calm weather, tropical to inferno. Let's double check that. Oxygen and water. Yes! We can recommend this planet. We need to come up with a name for it, and we are going to call it New Guado Salam. <laughs> We've done it, folks! After all of that, we finally, all of that exploring, we found a habitable planet. I don't know if this will give us enough money to upgrade our engines, but it should give us some cash to use to buy trade goods. So, unfortunately, at this point, we have yet to find a planet where we can buy trade goods cheap, uh, because the only planet we came across is the home world of one of the Tandaloo groups, and while we will land there and explore and talk to those folks eventually, my memory is it contains an inflated economy, which means it's a good place to sell, but a horrible place to buy. So we want to buy goods cheap and then come back and sell them there is what we need to do. Alrighty. So we started here, I believe. We ignored these two planets, or systems, and we basically hopped around and looked at all this stuff. So now if we head straight coreward back to 3573, we should be able to get back to our space station. And uh, a more exciting adventure. Or rather, money. We burned through about 30 units of fuel. We haven't picked up any kind of trade goods or anything. Oh, this isn't it. Let's just go check and see if our planet that we logged for colonization is going to work or if it's got too little gravity and therefore sucks ores and we can't use it. I mean, even if there's no gravity, we should still, people should be able to do artificial Star Trek gravity and wander around and do whatever. Magnet boots, something. They gotta be able to do some. First of all, let's see how much money we got. 95.18. Now let's head over here to operations. Name New Guado Salam. This planet proved to be suitable for colonization. You have earned a bonus of 40,000 shinium pennies for this recommendation. Okay. Now available in ship configuration are two new items which every captain is sure to want. The first is a device developed by our scientists right here at Starport. It is called a blastopod and fits into your ship just like a cargo pod. It is an extremely powerful torpedo designed for use in ship-to-ship -ship combat. Guaranteed to destroy any alien ship or your money back. These are available at the low price of only 50,000 shinium pennies. So the planet we call a recommended colonization got us less shinium pennies than it will cost to buy one of these blastopods. <laughs> Remember, quantities are limited. Your ship is equipped to carry up to two of these pods. 
Also available the new jump pods. These items were purchased from an alien race local to the sector. These also fit into your ship like cargo pods and allow you to make long jumps without the use of continuum fluxes. Your ship is equipped to carry up to four of these pods. All of them are best all of our best navigators are using them. One small thing though, we haven't yet been able to ascertain what it is that governs the accuracy of these pods though they do seem consistent after a fashion. This being the case, we are offering them at the one-time only low discount price of 20,000 SP. So, that planet was like worth, what, 40,000? Jeez, that really wasn't worth that much. Be sure to act now while the offer lasts. We included one complimentary jump pod for you to try out with no obligation. Now, once you get rich, jump pods are a handy way of saving a lot of time traveling. Time traveling, you know, with Doctor Who. Uh, no, they're, they're a great way to travel quickly. Uh, before you get rich, they're expensive, and uh, you can't use them to get anywhere that you couldn't get without them. Uh, I th- the I remember the hint manual explains, and I think someone eventually tells you in game that they are more accurate when you point to a coordinate that has stars nearby. So if you point to the middle of a cluster of stars, uh, your accuracy of hitting the target goes up because it has something to do with the gravity of the stars. And if you point out to the middle of nowhere, then your chances of hitting your target are quite low. There's been a report of two continuum fluxes very near Starport. One is located at 3370, and the other is at 2954. Recommend you proceed with caution. In addition, we have received numerous reports that seem to indicate the travel within the Cloud Nebula is extremely hazardous. For sale, 14 tons of delightful fungus chews. Must sell fast. They're a little moldy, but who's going to notice? Please see Captain Heimlich of the ISS Pequod. Pequod. I can never pronounce that word. Uh, It's like a famous real ship in history. Or no, it's isn't that the, from that book, Mutiny on the Bounty? No, that would be the Bounty. The peck is from a real book, though. I'm an idiot. Never mind me. You can find him on the third stool in the Nebula Lounge. End of notices. The only thing here that's worth really remembering is the uh, location of those two fluxes, but I'm not too worried about that right now. So we got 40,000, which is like two frickin' cargo pods. We started with 250,000, so we've actually got more money now than we started with. Wait, we started with 250,000? Or 25,000? We spent a total of, let's see, uh, 19 plus 13 is 32. If I can do math, which I'm not sure that I can. 19 plus 3 would be 22, plus 10 would be, I guess, 32. Call that another 1. Okay, there's a 42. I'm confused. How much money did we start the game with? Oh, ship configuration. Pl- uh, yeah, there's a minus and a plus there, J.G. Durhe. We started with 250,000. So, yeah, we've, uh, we've got more money now than we started with, which should mean that we can upgrade our engines... If we can upgrade our engines, then this whole trip will have been worth it. And according to the manual, class 4 isn't worth it. So we can buy class 3 engines. And then have some money left so that we can actually afford to buy trade goods. Okay pretty good. I'm going to call it a video here. I'm not going to save my game because of issues I've been having with uh, Camtasia. I want to make sure this records first. But assuming it does, when we come back, we now have enough money that I will have to decide, do we want to do more searching for hospitable, colonizable planets now that it's a little bit cheaper to go exploring because we burned through almost a third of our starting fuel just finding that one planet. Or, now that we've got a little bit of cash, do I want to start engaging in trade? Because you can't make money at trade unless you've got some money to start with. So, either way, folks, um, getting those Class 5 engines is going to be the most important thing. Uh, Once we've got Class 5 engines, we can start upgrading other things. We're going to want good shield. And Like I think in Starflight 1, I basically mined off-screen until I had level 5 engines, shields, and armor. And then I went out and explored, and you guys got to see the process of earning enough money for other stuff. Although, I don't think we even ever bothered to get Class 5 missiles in that game. Now, this game will probably end up getting uh, a fully loaded ship. At least fully loaded, like, you know, Triple H crotch chopping fully. I was, sorry, I always, that phrase always makes me think of one specific WWE video cover 
never watched it, but there was a video in the video store of Triple H chopping his crotch, DX Triple H, for the fully loaded pay-per-views. That's what I always think of, I'm sorry. But um, we're going to get the complete Class 5 everything, uh, because it's going to be a long time. The game is not going to end when we find the source of technology that the Spemmen are using. There will be a bit left to do after that. Um, but it's going to be a long time before we actually get our hands on the advanced weaponry the Spemmen are using to terrorize Arth. Uh, so we're going to need, just to, to be able to explore and survive, we're going to need to get ourselves up to level 5. Even with level 5 everything, we won't be a match for the Spemmen, but we'll be in good shape to actually fly around and do other stuff. So, enough talking. It's time to end the video. When we come back, lead to be trade or more planet colonization. But it's not going to be too long before we've got the level 5 engines we need before we can go out and start exploring, finding alien races, gathering clues, and overall... Playing Starflight 2 Trade Routes of the Cloud Nebula. This is Mysterious JG. I want to thank you guys for watching, and I look forward to joining you guys next time for the next video. Farewell, friends of the Elon.